Yeah, so, uh, so while uh, I think uh, David was maybe focused sort of the L2, L3 of how we access kernel objects from, uh, from BPF, in the previous talk, uh, this is maybe going slightly further up, we're looking at sockets. And um, basically, what can we do with sockets at the, um, uh, from a BPF packet path? And um, so for a bit of background, if you can't tell by my uh, t-shirt, um, I work on a, a project called Cilium. So Cilium provides networking and security for containers. Uh, it plugs into orchestration systems such as Kubernetes, um, and it's uh, divided up into mainly two components. So you've got a user space daemon written in Go, which uh, provides the, uh, the coordination with the orchestration system for um, when containers are being deployed onto a system. Uh, it provides a policy uh, API, which allows you to configure um, what's allowed to talk to what. Um, and it provides things like uh, visibility into the data path. Using all of this kind of uh, state information, the user space daemon compiles um, or generates the code for the data path and injects that into the kernel in the form of BPF. And then it'll attach that to physical devices or attach it to logical devices. Um, so, so yeah, the, the main thing is that, so it's providing the plumbing for containers and um, uh, the network policy. So when we talk about network policy, basically what we're trying to establish is some endpoint A is allowed to talk to some endpoint B. And um, you can do this via IP address. Um, you can do it IP addresses and ports. Um, maybe you have other ways to uh, specify the policy of how you actually want these two things to be able to communicate. Um, but fundamentally, when, when you say endpoint A can talk to endpoint B, what you're trying to say is that that session is, is allowed, and therefore packets from endpoint A are allowed to go to, packet, uh, to endpoint B. Um, and then packets in the reverse direction for that same session uh, are allowed to go from endpoint B back to uh, endpoint A. So this is sort of like implication. Um, so uh, how do we actually do this today? Um, so if you look at a lot of implementations out there, uh, basically we take packets off the device, we run it through this thing called a connection tracker, uh, which stores uh, five tuples of sessions that we've seen. Um, and then based on that connection tracker, you can turn uh, the basically packet five tuple and um, in possibly either direction into a unidirectional flow that says endpoint A is talking to endpoint B rather than the reverse. Um, so using that information, now that you say, okay, this is ingressing or egressing uh, for this particular five tuple, we look at our policy and we say, okay, is this thing actually allowed based on our policy? Um, so okay, so let's, let's do this with BPF. Uh, so you can uh, attach BPF to a packet hook so it'll allow you access into the, into the packets. Um, for the connection tracking, we can basically build a BPF map. Um, and uh, maybe you'll kind of see where I'm going with this based on the, the earlier talks today. Um, so yeah, if we put a, a BPF map here, we can key this by the five tuple. Um, then in the value of this map, uh, of these map entries, we can store uh, the ingress egress direction. Maybe you want to asso associate some counters there. Um, maybe you are performing some kind of network address translation and you want to associate that kind of information with the, uh, with the connection. Uh, there's a little bit of tuple flipping logic that you'll need in the, in the BPF to uh, reverse the direction of the tuple that you're looking up so that if you're getting a reply direction packet, you can tell that the original direction, uh, whether the original direction uh, had a corresponding connection tracking entry. Um, so that's good, okay. Policy, you know, however it is that you define your policy, you can create a BPF map. Maybe you uh, look at the IP addresses and that tells you yes, allow, or no, disallow. Um, and again, you could have counters associated with that. So okay, great, let's, let's deploy this. Um, so if any of you have done uh, any kind of scalability testing with NetFilter, you've probably hit this message before, this NF contract table full dropping packet. Um, so you know, the fundamental problem is like what happens when your connection tracking table becomes full. Uh, and if you're building something like a firewall kind of a, a solution, uh, you're not going to want to just uh, fail open and allow the, these packets through. You want to uh, drop these packets. Um, so there's a couple of kind of things that I want to bring up here. Um, so one is like you have to figure out what the size of this thing is going to be. Um, one, one aspect to this is that from a BPF perspective, we don't have resizable maps. So there's no way we could just dynamically size these things. Um, but even if we had something like that, like it's, a, it's also an open question. Do you want to be able to allow your uh, traffic to govern how big your table is going to be for your connection tracking? Um, 
And then there's a, the question of how do we actually clean up these entries. So uh, if your flows are all like reasonably short-lived, uh, well-behaved TCP connections, you know, maybe you can just look at the fin going one way, fin go the other way, and say, OK, we can clean up our connection tracking uh, table, and, uh, and we're done. Uh, but if you uh, start doing some more interesting stuff, you start hitting uh, UDP, things like this, where you don't actually have this information that the connection is done, um, then uh, that can sort of introduce some, some it basically makes it a bit more complicated. Uh, now, there are things like LRU map in the, uh, in the BPF um, API today. So you can just bounce out old entries from the map. Um, we have had some trouble with this um, because if you want your user space um, implementation to also take a look at this map, then simply by iterating through and taking a look at the map, it was touching these uh, elements in the map. Um, and so basically your LRU is, is completely messed up at that point. You don't actually know what was the last packet that um, was seen with this LRU. Um, so that th this kind of stuff gave us enough pause to, uh, to think, OK, well, like, is there some other way that we could do this? Um, but before we do that, like, it's worth asking the question, why do we actually model it like this? Why, why do we have this connection tracker in place? And, and um, what's the kind of advantages of that? And um, just make sure that we're not, not going to just violate our assumptions um, uh, when, we, when we try to build something new. Um, so an obvious thing would be that like firewalls are not always co-located with the workload. Um, so certainly it used to be you know you put this box in the middle of your network that is your firewall. You route all of your traffic into this thing. You have your sort of you know safe zone, unsafe zone, and you you pipe everything through this firewall. Um, even more recently, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, solutions which will push the um, security out to uh, nodes in the network, um, but maybe you're still running with VMs, and so your actual kernel. Uh, implementation or instance that is applying the security may not be the kernel instance where your workload is running. Um, so another aspect to this is that uh, firewalls should drop packets as quickly as possible. There's no point in paying the cost of receiving the packet all the way up the stack um, if you can trivially figure out at a much lower level um, this is something we don't want to pass up. Um, there's, there's definitely historically been this, this kind of problem with flaky stacks where if you send it the wrong kind of packet, it just kind of falls over. Um, I'd like to think that hopefully we're, we're in a much better state than uh, we were, say, 20 years ago with this kind of thing. Um, but even if something like this came up, I also think that these days the life cycle between you know, finding a bug, uh, reporting it, putting a fix upstream, vendors getting their hands on that and, and passing it to, a, um, to an end user is, is much tighter than it, than it used to be. Um, so, so based on these things, you can kind of see, well, it makes a lot of sense that you would um, build up state on demand while press, processing packets. So you get the packet in, you take a look at this packet, you store up some state, what, what state you need uh, to be able to uh, apply your firewall, and, and then, uh, yeah, move on. So, um, so a couple of recent trends that may change this, these assumptions. Uh, so one is the um, distribution of um, network implementation to nodes around your network. So rather than putting the firewall in the middle, um, you want to put firewalling on each node in your network. Um, and this doesn't necessarily just apply to firewalling. It could be the routing and so on. Um, and then the other one is, is the, the um, increasing um, use of containerization, where um, the actual you know, the workload is packaged up in this image where you deploy this, and the, the workload may actually be co-located on the same kernel instance um, as where your network plumbing is. Um, so if we're now getting to this, this place where the, uh, the workload is co-located with your routing and filtering uh, implementation, then that means that your sockets are also co-located uh, with um, with the, uh, the implementation that's providing the security around that. So if we're co-located with the sockets, like why would we build up this connection tracking table? Um, so what the connection tracking table is doing, right, is like it looks at the packets and says, like, okay, that went that way, that went that way. Um, and based on these packets it's seeing in the middle, it's trying to say this stack over here and this stack over here looks like this, and they have some understanding of what this connection is. Um, so if you're something in the middle that doesn't have introspection into those uh, remote um, stacks, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, 
But if we're increasingly getting into this world where actually one of those sockets is on the same uh, node and, and even in the same kernel instance, then uh, why do we try to infer what is happening with this connection tracking table? Why not just find that information that's already available? Um, so yeah, I have the same diagram, but I just replaced uh, the contract table with the socket table here. Um, this is not necessarily a one-to-one -one kind of uh, correspondence. Uh, connection tracking can often, an implementation may uh, have additional pieces on top of it rather than just what I've said uh, so far. So there may be things like TCP window tracking, things like that. Um, I'm more or less assuming that that kind of logic could be wrapped around um, this uh, socket table lookup. Um, so how do we do this? So fundamentally, we need to make sure that if we're going to reference, uh, if we're going to make use of these sockets, um, that that access is going to be safe. Um, so sockets are reference counted. Um, there is some memory management, um, uh, like RCU deferral of the free. Uh, I'll touch on that a bit more uh, later on. Um, so if we look at what's there, um, say um, I think six months ago or so, um, we had this BPF program type where you can attach uh, a BPF program to a uh, socket. Um, in that case, because it's operating in the socket context, there's already a reference held on the socket for the duration of executing the BPF program. So the access safety is provided via that mechanism. Um, and then um, there was uh, bound safety for when you access that pointer and you want to index into it, ensuring that the, uh, the indexing is within the bounds of the object that's pointed to from that pointer. Um, so when we look at trying to do this from a packet hook, uh, we don't have those same guarantees. Um, so there may or may not be a socket associated with the packet that you're inspecting. Um, so when we look this up, we need to somehow provide this, this safety around these, um, this socket lookup. Um, so that's where we get to, okay, extending the BPF verifier. So a quick recap of uh, the, the general way that this, this, uh, these BPF programs work. So, so there's some hacker in a room, darkened room with a, with a hoodie, he's like writing some source code. Um, he puts that into, the, uh, uh, into a compiler that generates BPF bytecode. That BPF bytecode can then be loaded into the kernel. When we load it into the kernel, we go through this, uh, this step called uh, the verification. So we go through all of the um, paths in this program. We validate that this program will be safe to run when we attach it to some point in the kernel. Uh, and then there'll be a, a JIT step there as well. So this diagram is, uh, is highlighting with TC ingress egress, but it's, it works the same way for the other uh, BPF folks. Um, so yeah, so at load time, basically what we're trying to check, loop over all the instructions, validate that the pointer access is going to be safe. Um, you know, if it accesses the memory outside the, the bounds of that pointer, uh, reject. Um, if it looks like this is this program is going to loop forever, we reject it. So we can bound the uh, the runtime of this um, application um, to 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 ensure that. Uh, so eventually, if everything is safe, okay, great. Allow the pack, uh, allow the program to be loaded and attach it. Um, so when we're looking at trying to do this for sockets, um, there's a couple of different ways we could do this. So we could do this implicitly. Um, so in this case, the person writing the BPF, uh, BPF code you know, maybe writes something like this in C. You do a lock, look up of the, uh, of the socket, and then you may use it. You, know, you have to check if it's, if it's a valid pointer. You use it, and you basically forget about it. Um, so behind the scenes, what the kernel needs to do at the runtime for this uh, model is that when you perform the socket lookup, it needs to store that pointer on some free list. And then once you've finished executing your entire um, BPF program, you need to go and iterate through this list and free all of the sockets. Um, so when you look at what is happening in like XDP, the fact that there would be a uh, step after each BPF program where you need to check whether you need to free sockets, uh, this is not very good, because this is a cost that would be incurred regardless of whether you're using the socket lookup helpers or not. Um, so what we ended up going with instead is, is we make this explicit. So developers need to know that they are taking a reference on the socket and they need to explicitly release that. 
And it's very natural. You know, it's, you just need to balance the uh, the, the sockets, uh, socket lookup and release. Um, so how do we actually do this in the verifier? So you've got the step where you acquire the resource. Uh, you've got the step where you're perhaps holding this resource. We need to make sure that the um, the use of that resource is valid. And then you've got the release. So when we look at uh, re resource acquisition, so at the time when we are verifying this program, we don't actually have references to sockets and so on. We're not actually executing this code. We're statically analyzing this is the, the, the steps through the BPF program. So through this particular path, it takes a reference to a socket. Um, so we need to somehow um, track the fact that this particular path through the program has a reference to the uh, socket and uh, ensure that at the end of the program, we've released all of the references that we've uh, acquired. So um, how do we do this? We basically generate an identifier that is, uh, basically uniquely identifies that particular socket lookup. So if you have multiple socket lookups in your program, each one would, uh, when on the instruction where it returns the pointer, uh, we associate an identifier with that particular instance of the execution of that um, uh, socket lookup. And then, uh, so we store this in the verifier state, and basically at the end of the program, we will uh, go through these at the end of verification. So once we ensure that uh, the program reaches the end instruction, the exit instruction, um, we ensure that there are no references still being held. Uh, and there's another piece here, which is we need to associate the register that receives this pointer um, with this identifier. So this allows us to, uh, later on in, in the verification, we can pass this, when we see that the, the instructions pass this register to um, some other function, or when it dereferences that uh, instruction, or when it passes that uh, register, as in that pointer, to the free function, that the types are correct and, and, uh, and the bounds checking can be, can be done. So a few steps for the um, uh, execution time within, like while holding this um, reference. Um, so one of them is that in, no, if someone, someone could write a, a program that says, you know, I will take this socket pointer and then I'll mangle it in some way and then I'll try and pass it to the, to the release function, right? And then the release function wouldn't be getting a valid pointer. So okay, disallow that. Um, BPF tail call is another one. Um, so this is the feature which allows you to take one BPF program and then chain it onto another BPF program. Um, but there's no mechanism right now to be able to pass this socket state uh, between one BPF program to another BPF program. So if the first BPF program performed the socket lookup and did not release it, but tail called to another BPF program, then you're basically leaking a reference to that socket. So but if you release before the tail call, it's okay. If you release before the tail call, it's okay. Um, so there's another interesting one uh, the, with the load absolute and load indirect. So even if we ensured that the BPF program um, has balanced lookup and release functions and will reach the end of this, um, uh, the, the program, these instructions could potentially um, uh, cause some problems. Um, so th these instructions, basically the idea is they were used to index into a packet and if the, um, if that, if the packet is not long enough to um, like it is shorter than the index that you're indexing there, then basically it would terminate the BPF program at runtime. Um, so what this means is like from a verification perspective, you could have a perfect program that uh, balances your, your, your lookup and release. Um, but when you actually go to run that, if it has one of these instructions in the middle of while holding that socket release, uh, so while holding that socket, sorry, um, then you've basically leaked the, uh, the socket there as well. Uh, so finally, we've got uh, yeah, reference release. So we need to validate that the pointer type that we pass into this release function is the correct pointer type, uh, that it hasn't been mangled and so on. Um, and then we need to clean up the state and say, okay, so if this particular um, resource, which is cor corresponds to this identifier, has been released, um, then we don't need to track whether or not it's going to be released after that point. Um, yeah. And then uh, finally, the... the uh, register association with that identifier needs to be cleared so we don't try to um, allow a program to index within some um, socket pointer after the socket pointer has been uh, released. 
so looking a bit at the uh, API. So if you wanted to do this uh, socket lookup, socket release, you know, the simplest possible um, implementation would look something like this. So you can imagine passing the SK buff in. The SK buff already has metadata about uh, what the um, packet content set is. Um, and so you could imagine just looking up the socket for this particular packet. Um, so one aspect to this is, so if you, if you look at the way that Kubernetes configures um, networking, typically what you'll have is you'll have the host namespace. Within that namespace, you'll have a network namespace. They call it a pod. This shares the network uh, namespacing between multiple containers. So if you wanted to implement um, some sort of socket introspection logic in the host namespace, then you want to be able to figure out what, uh, what sockets are associated with applications running inside of a separate network namespace. So we need some sort of network namespace identifier. Um, arbitrary socket lookup. So while it's true that you could just allow the socket to be looked up for this particular packet, um, it's far more flexible and useful for uh, the BPF developer to be able to pass this um, tuple explicitly to the lookup function. So um, one, one reason is, um, if you built in this assumption that it's got the SK buff, uh, that it can get this metadata easily, then when you try to plug the same um, helper function into the XDP side, well, you no longer have the SK buff. So um, it's going to be much easier to uh, write BPF programs that will work at either of the um, uh, like CLS Act or uh, XDP hook points if, if uh, they can have a consistent um, signature. Uh, and then another one is like if you do any kind of network address translation, that kind of thing, um, then it would be nice to be able to put that logic where you want it to be inside of your BPF program rather than forcing you to um, apply packet translation onto the buffer and then pass that buffer into your helper so that you can look up the appropriate socket. Um, so there's a few notes on extensibility. So there was a bit of discussion on the list about uh, is there a reuse port um, and which socket you would actually find when you do this lookup. So if, if multiple applications have uh, sockets corresponding to the same five tuple, you actually have multiple sockets there. Um, so there may be, I don't have a specific use case, but there may be some um, use case in future for um, allowing configuration of how uh, or influencing which socket will actually be found uh, via this lookup function. <coughs> Um, and another aspect, aspect to extensibility um, is determining socket type support at load time. So ideally, when you insert your BPF program into the kernel, you can tell what the support of some particular function is going to be at that time, rather than just successfully loading this um, BPF program into the kernel and find out later on, oh, I don't support UDP, or I don't support SCTB. Um, so the idea behind this is, if we can form the API such that if the socket type is supported for what we're trying to look up, then we will load the program. If the socket type is not supported, then we'll reject that program. So that makes it far more explicit for developers. Um, so uh, a couple of optimizations. So I mentioned earlier that uh, for some socket types, the release of the socket, the free of the socket is RCU deferred. So in those cases, we can actually, while we uh, provide the constraint to BPF developers that they must balance these lookup and release functions. In the actual implementation behind the scenes, we don't need to take that reference. We can guarantee that for the lifetime of the execution of the BPF program, that it's um, running under RCU, and so uh, that socket will be available for the duration of the execution of the program. Um, so that, that saves us a little bit of um, a couple of atomics. Um, Another one we, uh, we did was to allow the, uh, the lookup using packet pointers. So rather than forcing BPF developers to extract the tuple from the packet onto the stack and then pass a pointer from the stack um, into this lookup helper, instead you can just find the appropriate index into your packet and just pass that pointer directly to the lookup function. Um, now this only works if your packets are particularly formed where you have the IP addresses right next to your ports. So if you've got um, you know, IP fragmentation, anything like that, then it's not going to work for that case. Um, so that logic would need to be built into your, into your BPF program. Uh, so this is what we ended up uh, with. So we've got different lookup helpers for TCP and UDP. Regardless of which of those you use, you need to pass it to the release function. Um, the 
uh, context needs to be passed in as the first parameter, so that will differ depending on whether you're running it at uh, CLS Act or at uh, XDP. You can see the explicit tuple there. We've got a tuple size, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, and we've got this net and s, and then the flags allows us to potentially extend this in future. So right now, we'll reject uh, any applications which attempt to use non-zero flags. So again, this is this kind of um, reject what we don't support, and then in future, we can loose, uh, loosen these restrictions. Um, so looking at the tuple that you pass in, it's, it's a full tuple. Uh, so protocol is, is explicitly part of the, uh, the function uh, name. Uh, you can see here we've got IPv4 and IPv6. So to determine whether you should look up a v4 or v6 socket, we infer this based on the uh, tuple size that you pass in. So if you pass in size of uh, tuple.ipv4, then we'll do a IPv4 lookup. If you pass in um, size of tuple.ipv6, we'll do an IPv6 socket lookup. Um, Here's a brief look at what's available for the socket. So from your BPF program, here's what you can access today. Uh, I presume that this will be extended in the future. There's definitely um, some other interesting pieces that we want to be able to look at from a BPF program. Uh, so finally, so there's, a, there's another use case for this. Um, so I've mainly focused on uh, stateful firewall and kind of cases. Uh, but there's another one where there are vendors which will provide a box which is running Linux. Um, they will take packets into the software, and then maybe they're ri running BGP or SNMP or various other protocols on the uh, management CPU there. And they want to be able to determine when you receive packets, is this packet corresponding to the uh, control connection that I have for an application running on my um, my system. So if it is BGP or whatever, you can pass it up the stack. If it's not, then you jump over to the logic which performs your forwarding, routing, you know, whatever the, the function of your device is. Um, so the socket lookup from XDP that was merged into BPF Next uh, just recently, so this use case is now uh, supported as well. Uh, briefly, um, a little bit on future work. So um, it'd be nice to be able to gain access to more socket attributes. Uh, so one of the things might be something like uh, TCP state. Now, how exactly we want to reflect that in the BPF API is a question, whether you want to have some sort of generic, um, you know, this is in an um, unreplied uh, kind of state, or we've seen two-way traffic, or so on, um, or whether you want to get more granularity into, like, it's TCP time wait, that kind of thing. That's sort of an open question. Um, I'm sure some of you would, uh, would be able to suggest some other uh, attributes that we may want to access, but we do need to think about how to do this in a sensible way so that we're not just exposing everything and uh, making things difficult for us. Um, there's one point which, so for the uh, connection tracking map that I referred to uh, much earlier, um, I talked about the different things you might want to put in the value for the, uh, for the connection tracking entry. Um, so there's kind of a, an analog here as well, where we may want to associate some metadata with the socket. Um, and exactly how we do this is, is sort of an open question. Right now, what we can do is we can say, okay, we'll just put a BPF map, we'll index it by the five tuple, and then we can store whatever information we want. But then again, we're, we've got this problem where we are now sizing, we, are, we now have to figure out the size of this map and so on. And so the, the sort of benefit of being able to tie directly to what sockets are actually existing on the system or not, um, is, uh, you know, we've lost that benefit. So it'd be nice to be able to, for instance, maybe ahead of time you'd say, um, I want 64 bytes of metadata um, whenever I do a socket lookup, or maybe we have a new helper that says, like, give me the uh, scratch buffer associated with the socket, um, then we can put something in there, um, and then maybe we can store our counters or our net state or whatever else we want in there. Um, and then the other thing that, uh, so this reference tracking, fortunately, is, is sort of written in a very, um, um, I guess, generic kind of a way. Um, so this is quite separate from the socket handling logic. Um, so what this will allow us to do is build things like uh, locking primitives and so on um, on top of that uh, reference tracking implementation. Um, so that's all I've got. Thank you. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions for Joe's work, ask them now. Nobody? <laughs>
Okay. Thank you very much, Joe, for your presentation. Thank you.